Come here, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining me. Otto, welcome. Anika, welcome. Hello, Nancy. Ciao, Giovanni. Wrong. Good morning. Well, thank you all for coming. Hello, Ethel. Hello, Sandra. All right, so some people it's morning, some of you it's evening. Um, all welcome. Hello, Raffaele. Oh, it's great to have you. Um, so Thursday is pretty much a repeat of, Friday is pretty much a repeat of Thursday. Um, lots of good questions from yesterday. I want to re-go over those um, questions. Um, Raffaele, Giovanni, um, there's lots of artists watching, so if you have questions, um, uh, they're very good about answering, which is fantastic. Very kind of them. Hello, Rick Klein. Good morning. Um, so let's go ahead and start. I'm going to uh, put the camera down. Thank you for joining. I'm going to put the camera down here. And maybe bring it up a little bit. Um, there we go. Let's kind of shut my lines to see if that'll help. I don't think it does, nope. Awesome. Hello Misha. Hello Denoy. Okay, so this is um, this is week three of the masky fluid, getting kind of uh, uh, running out of masking fluid. This is, we put this down three weeks ago, so each week I've taken some of it off. And let me get it going here without any fingernails. So. so that's Lana Acquarell. Um And there we go. So it comes off. If you do it with your finger, like that piece right there, we just pull that off too. There we go. So that's after um, three weeks, and we'll just try it again. So we'll do four weeks. We have probably enough to do, and that'll be a month. Um, most of you aren't going to have it go past a month. I just thought it'd be kind of fun to do. So we'll do it one more time next 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 week. That will give us a month. Okay. Hello, Nancy. Oh, the, the earth colors were really good yesterday. We're going to go over the same earth colors today. Um, and then we'll still have probably probably about uh, 14 left. So there's quite a few of them. It's a very big category. The questions that you asked were really good questions. So I want to kind of review the questions. Um, one more time. This is what we've done so far. I'm not including, not including today. We'll get through quite a few today. Two, four, six, eight, ten. We'll probably go through twenty today. So we're making, we're making really good ground. I thought about this yesterday. Um, some of you say you don't have really good printers to print out the color chart, and boy, I, I certainly understand that. Um, working from home, I had the same issue. But if you bring this to um, Kinko's or your local uh, printer, uh, it's probably 35 to maybe, I, I don't know, 35 cents, 50 cents a page. And there's really only one, two, three, four, five pages you really need, to, really three pages you really need to print. Um, so three pages. Five pages will give you the Primatex and the Luminescent. And they could print it out. It would probably look really quite nice. Um, it just takes a while to get the color charts out. Even though we send those out it's, it's, uh, to distributors, it's, it's, it's 
been quite hard to get those out to everybody. All right, so I thought I'd go over to some of the um, questions that were asked, because they were really good questions. Misha, one of these is from you. So I'm going to start from the back first. Um, so Misha, who's on right now, does this mean that in general p particles in transparent pigments are more intense in color? And um, no, not really. What it means is each pigment, each pigment is unique. It's unique to its own specific properties of weight, of size, and of shape. And those really constitute um, staining, for example, um, granulation, and opacity, and chemically, um, light fastness. So it's really about each specific pigment and the particles that make, make that up. Um, so great question. What is the difference between pyrroles and pyrrolines? Pyrrolines. Okay, and I'm going to post this. I think some of you were interested in seeing it. So we'll just briefly go over it again. So pyrroles and perylenes. So as you remember when we did the droughts of the pyrroles and the perylenes, the pyrroles are actually more, um, these are two very vibrant, um, two very vibrant colors, two vibrant families of colors. Um, so it's really saying which one's louder because they're both pretty loud. But the pyrroles are both more vibrant when wet and more vibrant when dry as compared to the perylenes, which also are extremely vibrant, um, but just when compared against the pyrroles, they're not as vibrant. So the pyrroles are used for auto automotive paint, um, industrial coatings, they're made for inks, plastics, and fiber applications. Um, they have a very high chroma, they have a high color strength, which you, you would expect. They have high weather fastness and high light fastness. And you expect that of anything that was made for the automobile industry or industrial because they want it to last a long time in terms of heat, um, light, etc. This is what the, and I'll post this for those of you that really like this. Let me lift this up a little bit. Okay. And this is what the molecule looks like. And um, for, for each of these, so pyrrol, you asked about the name as well, it's diketo pyrrol, oh, pyrrol, pyroli. So it's a double, double pyrrol. And so Ron, my chief chemist, just took the pyrrol as the name. Remember when I said it was a it was a single pigment? We used the, the name of the menu, the the person that created it. Well, this was definitely a big pigment house, chemistry house. Instead of giving it this whole name, we just took a piece of the name for the colors. So pyrrol red, pyrrol scarlet, pyrrol crimson. And so this is the whole molecule. And if you want to look at this at home or on your own computer. Then right here, what makes pyrrole crimson different is it takes this molecule and substitutes it right here. So it's this whole piece goes right here, and then it has these two other um, attachments. And the same thing here with pyrrole orange. It would take this, put it here, and then you'd have other attachments. And it's how these right here rotate, because these are, these are these are all this. So it's really how these right here rotate that changes the color. Remember when we talked about, um, oh, you're welcome, Nancy. Nancy said, thanks for shortening those pigment names. Uh, remember when we talked about the uh, quinacridones, it was how the alpha and beta particles move around the chain that causes the different colors. For example, PV19 um, is pigment rose, pigment red, uh, and, uh, and violet. It's all three, and it's just a matter of how those, how these right here, the alpha beta particles there, but how these right here twist around and move in relation to this molecule. 
Okay. Okay, so then let's look at the paralines. And the paralines are also for the auto, auto, automobile paint. Um, they're used as colorants. Um, they're used in fiber and they're used in engineering resins. So very um, complicated, diverse uh, pigment. This is what it looks like. That's the molecule. And then this right here just gets substituted. This right here would go right here where the R is. These are all the R groups. So if we look at perylene red, fire engine red, this group right here would get put right there and put right there. So it's the same molecule for each. What changes that makes the color difference is how these are attached here. This attached here. So for those of you that like it, I'm, I'm just really, I'm really glad that you like that. It's very, very interesting. So that's the difference between the two. They're very, very different. They're very different molecules um, that share the change in colors by how these different R groups are attached and where they're attached. So thank you for asking that. So I always read your questions when I'm done, and if I can't answer it now, I will certainly um, answer it later. I mean, I, your questions are just really great. Pyrols are, yeah, they're super intense. If you like quinacridones, you probably like, you probably would like pyrols. Um, and then the earth tones, I mean, each set, it really, it's really, um, if you're a mechanic, a screwdriver is important to you, a pliers is impor important to you, a wrench is important to you. It just depends on what you happen to be working with. And I think the same thing is true for you as artists. These are just tools. These are just tools in your toolbox. And then it's you as the master um, uh, defining your artwork, master artist, artist, that is choosing what you want to use to be able to accomplish your vision. So um, a craftsman, what type of saw, etc. Um, so Scott, yes, I will post those. Um, Scott does fantastic Zoom demonstrations. Um, and Scott, I'm going to be sending you your mineral. I have them here on my desk. Um, I will get those to you. Okay, um, Anna Marie. Anna Marie asked lots of questions. So pyrrole and perylene are not the same underlying chemistry? No, different chemistry used in industry, so they're both used in industry, they're both used in automotive, they're both high weather fastness, light fastness, they have good um, heat resistance, which makes them very useful. Let's see, um, where does the yellow come from? There's no yellow in the Primatech, this is Narita. Um, yeah, there is no, there are yellows in the Primatechs, they're just they would not be good to use. For example, sulfur is beautiful. Sulfur is also something which would just be play havoc within the art world. Um, so there's lots of colors that are available in minerals. There's just, um, it's just making sure they can pass toxicology and many of them, um, some of them uh, can't pass, so therefore we won't use them. And are they different than what we already have? That has to be another question. And um, will they cause any adverse effects? Like have, have a high pH or a very low pH, um, then we won't use them. So we, we want stability, we want high light fastness, um, but we really want them to be stable for the artist. And that limits yellows. Yellows are very problematic as a color. Is the U a single pigment or a mix? So a U can actually be, H-U-E-U, -U, can actually be um, either in some watercolors, it's a single pigment. For example, manganese uh, blue U, which is PB15, is a single pigment. Um, I also talked to Ron, and we have two colors, cadmiums. One is a cadmium yellow medium U, and the other one is a cadmium yellow deep U. And those are co-precipitated. And if you remember back to the co-precipitated, it's two pigments that are chemically locked by the manufacturer. So um, they're really considered to be one pigment, 
We list both in our color chart, but by definition, they're one pigment. And then when you add when you add water, these can break apart, and that's why the, ca the uh, cascade green, you get the blues and the greens and the yellows, it's quite beautiful. Um, so these two cadmium U's um, are also one pigment because they're co-precipitated. So the answer is they can be one or they can be they can be multiple. It just it just it depends. It can be either. How do pigments move? This um, is from Eve. How do pigments move in the matrix if the paint is dry? So when the when the paint film, so when the paint film is wet, the particles can move. So if we put lunar black and we wet it down, we're going to see some some today when I um, wet some of these out. Um, the particles, particles can move, but once it's dried, they're locked. So when the, when it's a, when the film dries, it's locked. Um, so here's the here's the whites. So I'm going to show you in a minute. These are all locked. It's dried. Now they're locked. If it was wet, there'd still be we can move it around because they'd still be able to be moving within this film. They're all going to move. It's to what degree they move that causes the opacity, for example. I will post those diagrams. Um, how, does that, how does that process happen? Uh, okay, this is, this is from Anna Maria again. Sometimes the vocabulary around watercolors is reflective rather than using opaque or semi-transparent. What is the difference? So, um, opacity, which I'll show you here. Is when we have a color, we'll take our photospectrophotometer and we'll present this to the photospectrophotometer to get a readout. When we talk about um, reflection or refraction, if we think about our um, iridescent, iridescent and interference, um, this one is reflective. This one is refractive. What happens in the reflective is the light beam comes down, encounters the particle, and bounces back like this. So that is considered reflective. Vibrancy, etc., are going to change between the reflective and the refractive. If you remember the, the iridescent, you can see it over the white, and you can see it over the black. The iridescent or interference, very difficult to see over white, almost invisible, but you can see it over the black. And that's because the interference are refractive. They come down, they engage the particle, and they refract in all different directions. That's called scattering of light. And it's not going to be as bright, it's not going to be as bright or as vibrant as reflective. Um, so, Garab, it's actually um, very similar. It's actually um, surface tension is the biggest thing that makes the particles move. So the particles move mainly because of surface tension. If one particle has a, um, a lower surface tension, then a, another particle might be drawn to it. If this particle has a, a high, in general now, if this has a higher surface tension than this one here, it may repel this one. But mostly, the, the movement within the film is caused by surface tension. M mostly. Good questions. Okay. Um, oh, so let me let me go over that a little bit further. So another question was asked: Is um, semi-transparent versus semi-opaque? So when we so in the laboratory, the um, chemists look for three things, four things, but we only report 
three, and I'll tell you why. They use these numbers here, zero to 40, 41 to 60, 61 to 75, and 76 to 100 to define opacity. Um, so transparent is, is zero to 40, semi-transparent is here. This is semi-opaque, which is a word that we don't use, and this one is opaque. When we brought our watercolors out, people already within the uh, watercolor um, market, Windsor Newt, for example, was, was, is extremely big, um, reported on three. They reported on transparent, they reported on opaque, and they reported on semi-transparent. And we did the same thing they did. We just combined this group right here from 41 to 75 and we call that semi-transparent. So that's why if you look at our color chart, we have transparent, we have semi-transparent, which goes over this entire range right here, and we have opaque. So that was a great question. Thank you for that. The way that we do this is, um, I think I've showed this to you before, we put the colors we put the color over black, and if you see black, right here, high degree of black, then it's transparent. If you see a little bit of the black, but you also see the red here, for example, that is semi-transparent. You could, depending on where this falls, if we wanted to break out the numbers, call this semi-opaque, but we're just gonna lump it all together, call it semi-transparent, because that's what the industry does. And then the last one, you see a lot of green. I mean, here in front of me, it's a lot of green. Hard to see that because the camera's trying to show it black, but there's a lot of green on this, more green than black. That's considered opaque. The, the green is camouflaging the black or overpowering it. That's considered to be opaque, okay? Great question. Uh, many independent light, many independent light fast tests have shown Aurelian not to be permanent. While while light may not be the reason for fading, it still fades. And that so panicky that always that depends, and and the reason it depends is who is manufacturing the pigment. Um, pigment is made by many manufacturers, and it really depends on the manufacturer and how they manufacture it. And when the manufacturer tests it, what is the light fastness? And then we have, we're, we have a full laboratory. We also have all the machines to test for light fastness. So we will test it ourselves to make sure it matches what the manufacturer says. So our Aurelian, which may not be equal to another company's Aurelian, because it, it can all be purchased from different places, our Aurelian is light fastness too. So this is our Aurelian, and it's light fast. It's light fastness too. 100 years. 100 years in direct light, not indirect light. Indirect, all one word. Indirect, um, not direct. Uh, for example, in your house, on a wall, um, not put outside in the sun for for 50 days. Um, normal usage, gallery, um, museum, your house. Um, if it's going to be in your house and it's going to be more in direct light than behind UV glass, of course. Um, so, but it's a light fastness of two. John, you mentioned, this is from Valerie. John, you mentioned phthalo blue turquoise is the only phthalo that doesn't have a metal. That's correct. Good memory. Um, that's because there's no copper molecule in the middle of it. And that's just how, when they created this new uh, pigment, they had a new way of doing it, and they created it without, without a metal. Um, can, this is uh, Suda, can you please show rose matter brush out? This is the original rose matter genuine. We call it genuine because it has a pedigree of how it was made. It was made over, um, made for, just an infinite number of years um, was made by boiling the rose matter root and then laking that against the metal halide to create a pigment and then from the pigment to create the paint 
So this is what it looks like. This was a very, this is 1995. This is, was very difficult to, to make this color uh, because it is made from a plant um, and it's a dye that's then late, so therefore it's considered by definition a pigment, still fugitive, but a pigment. Um, it was very difficult. It's very difficult for having anything that is natural um, to have the same consistency every single time. Um, so very difficult uh, color to have the same match time and time and time again. This is, so the last iteration of the Rose Matter Genuine, I think about eight years ago, 10 years ago, the last one of these we did was, was actually closer to this. So you can see the difference. Um, and that's just because it changed time and time and time again. So this is the Rose Matter Permanent. And this is a, a one, so this is 100 plus years in indirect light. So, there you go. Almost anything, for the most part, again, it's, it's you can always find exceptions to the rule. Um, for the most part, any type of a plant material, etc., cetera, um, is gonna be fugitive, unless there's some huge chemistry done, and, and there, that can be done. Again, that's why it's in general. Um, there were colors that were made from beetles. There were colors that were made from mollusks, and, and those were also fugitive. We only have two fugitive, two fugitive colors, alizarin, crimson, and opera pink. Those are the only two that we have. We used to have the rose matter, but we, we moved to um, this right here, which is made with, with light fast pigments. Hello, John. Um, oh, this question is on the color chart or the series numbers. So I'm gonna watch the time to make sure I get through all the colors for you. Okay. So we have these numbers right here. For example, um, this is a one, and this is a three. And that's just, this is called the series number. And that's how we um, communicate MSRP to the distributors and the retailers. Um, they can sell it for what they want. Um, this is just our way of conveying, conveying that, um, what the MSRP is, manuf manufacturer su suggested retail price. And the way that we come up with these is, um, if, it's, if I could produce a lot of it, if I could produce it um, uh, quick, um, if the pigment isn't um, usually expensive, I try to give it the lowest series possible because everything as a manufacturer, it's all about time. The, the more I make, then I, I can put that cost over more pieces and, and lower, lower the cost. I try to do that wherever I can. So the majority of all of our colors are ones and twos. Um, there are some uh, the Primatex are very difficult, um, so they're higher numbers, um, but the majority are ones and twos, and that's what that number means. Yeah, so Eve says, I'd, I'd say a ruling is about as fugitive as genu genuine matter, and it, again, it's going to depend on, on who's a ruling you're using because it all comes down to the, the pigment. And what the if you're starting with a pigment that is a light fastness two, and the manufacturer will tell you that, um, then it's gonna be a light fastness two. If you start with something that's lower than that, then pretty much no matter what you do to it, that's what's gonna stay. Um, so it's important to look as to what the, the, the company you're buying from, what, what their You know, I can't speak for other companies. It's, it's, just, it's, I know that we're gonna test it with our xenon feedometer. So I know that we, even though the, the, the company that we're buying from and they're multi-billion dollar companies that BASF, for example, they're just huge companies. Um, we're still gonna test it. Um, the majority of all of our pigments here 
um, are going to come from either uh, United States or they're going to come from uh, UK or EU. So, but you have to check. I mean, it's going to be, it's not, at the end of the day, um, it's our name on the tube and not their name. So we always check. Let's see. We're going to go over Oak Roost today. Okay. So then go over here. This is what our um, whites turned out from last time. So this is the Chinese white. This is the titanium white. This is the buff white. And this is the gray titanium. And that's what they look like when they're dry. So when I give the C lab numbers and, and, and post those, one question was asked, it was a really good question. There's always a difference between what the machine says the number is of where it lies. For example, someone said, well, I, I, I would think that for my eye, the Chinese white is warmer than the, like, the titanium. That absolutely may be true, absolutely. Because there's, there's a difference between what we see with our eyes and how our brain interprets the color than a machine. A machine is just gonna say, this thing I'm looking at falls within this range. So I have both those. I have the C lab, and you can look at those. And you can also um, use the, uh, the dot cards, um, et cetera, to see what it looks like from your eye. And so both those can be right. The machine can say, well, actually, this one's warmer. But when you look at it with your eye, you can say, well, this one's warmer. A-OK. -okay. Um, let's see. Get this. Get this. I'm going to show you this. Then we'll look at colors. So this is the, we did this some time ago. This is the, I put masking fluid all over it. This is, this is the um, walnut ink. And you had asked questions, I don't know if I had answered it, so I wanted to make sure I brought it and answered your question. So walnut ink has a light fastness of two, which means 100 years. The staining is a two, which means it's low staining. It is transparent. It does not granulate. And it is approved. ACMI, which means ACMI is Duke University. It's toxicology. Um, toxicology, we provide all of our formulations, um, all of our recipes to um, ACMI. They do, they're toxicologists, so they're MD, PhD, chemists or biochemists. They're, they have both degrees. Um, they do all the testing. If they have questions, they send it out to another independent laboratory, and that laboratory will give us back the information and simultaneously give back Duke University information, and then the toxicologist um, rates it. So this is approved. Okay, so that's that's about staining. So there's ASTM, and ACMI. So this is standard testing, associated with any test, testing methods, and now they put an I for international. And this one does light fastness. And then the ACMI does the APCL. This is Duke University. So to answer your question, um, Eve, if so, ASTM has a book, and in that book, they have lists and lists and lists of pigments and what they have found in their testing uh, of the pigments. So they can have a ruleian, for example. They have a ruleian, 
and within their list they have different light fasts of a rulian, and one of them is a two. So then the manufacturer of the Aurelian um, has to come up with their light fastness as well. And so they'll put whatever it is. For example, what we buy from is a two. If it's not within the ASTM, for example, um, the Primatex, because it's not within the ASTM, they don't have it listed, then we, we put um, an NR. It's, it's not there, it's not in that book. Although we do the test, the same test with our Z9 photometer, all we're saying is that it's not in their book. Um, but everything is tested um, by the second group, which is the toxicology group. So, good question. Thank you. Uh, and what about the blue wool scale? Yeah, blue wool scale is another way that um, things are done. There's all different types of methods. So um, blue wool is another way to look at light fastness. So sometimes the blue wool, blue wool, they'll have, for example, a seven. And you go, wow, wait a minute, how can that be if it's a one, two, three, and a four? Where'd, where'd seven come from? It's just a different, different way of looking at it. So the blue wool seven, for example, is comparable to a light fastness of one. So just a different standard. Um, it's like the C lab. You can do RGB. You can do C within that. You can do C lab. You can do R RGB, C Y A N. Um, there's just all different standards, and, and usually for industries, ind industries will standardize on how they look at things. Um, so within the um, within our industry, we use light fast one, two, and three. Um, Another industry that might do plastics might might do the blue wool or some other type of test because that is their standard. So, good questions. Good questions. Okay, ten minutes. I gotta. I want to show you some stuff really quick. Oh my gosh, I'm running out of time. Okay, so I just wanted to bring this. This is the titanium white, and this is the Chinese white. And this is over the same white paper. So this, it's painted over this as well. So it's, this, this is a whole entire wash. And this is a gradient. And so you can see there's the titanium, and there's the Chinese white. And you can use these uh, with a color to make it more gouache-like because you're, you're gonna increase the opacity. But I just wanted to show you, someone asked, um, what does it look like over white? And there's the Chinese white over white, and there's the titanium over white. Almost, for the most part, almost invisible. Unless you move it around, you can kind of see the, see the wash here. And you can see the lines, a couple lines here, but it's really, really light. I'm just impressed how the camera picks that up because um, here in front of me, it's, it's, it's really hard to see. Okay? All right. And then this question was asked by Rin. And Rin said, um, which is your darkest, which is your darkest color? And normally, I, you know, I would just go lamp black, but lamp black is not the darkest color. If you look at the C-Lab here, the warmest color for whites is actually Chinese white. It's a 97. Hygiene goes 100. 96 is very close. I mean, very close. Um, but it's a 97. And if you look at the darkest colors, again, right here, the lower number is the darker. So highest is 100, lowest is 0. It's indigo. You say, wow, how, how, is, that, how is that possible? Why wouldn't it be lamp black? Um, so indigo is both a mixture of endanthrone blue plus lamp black. Okay, that's indigo, it's a mixture of these two. And the reason is that the lamp black kind of gives a false reading. And that's because there's, the way the pigment behaves, it doesn't completely cover everything. There, you can see some of the white in here. See the white? So, and that's up in here too. We would present that to the photospectrophotometer, it gets somewhat of a false reading. Um, whereas we look at the endanthrone, which is the, the next darkest color, it's equal to these, these are both 28s. 
it has way, well, it has some white in here. It has way less white up in here and way less white up in here. And if we look at the indigo, it has almost no white. And that's why indigo has a lower reading than both in Danthron or Lamp Black. Now, not by much, you know, 28, 28, 27, it's, it's, it's really super, super small. But if we're looking at the numbers, we would say it's indigo. Now, the other part becomes what we talked about before, which is you as an artist or as a person looking at this with your eyes, your eyes may tell you something different. And that's because we have this beautiful brain um, behind our eyes that it just interprets so many things, which is just super wonderful. But that was a great question. Okay. I thought your questions are really, really good. All right. And this right here. This is an article that you may like, and I'm, I'm not going to post it because I have to go and get the uh, permission to post, and it would just take a, a just a, a long time to get that, and I wouldn't post it without getting it. So, um, however, they do have this article online, and if you want to see this article called "Why Particle Sizing," it talks about um, um, opacity, it talks about staining. It talks about tinting. If you kind of like this, then just let me know somewhere in, just give me a message, John. I'd like to see that article. And I'll go through over the weekend and I will put this um, link into your message and you can read this article. Now, if you want to, you can also find it yourself, Why Particle, why particle Sizing. And it's done by the um, paintings and coating industry. And you can find it, but I'd be glad to um, put this link inside of the message back to you. Okay. It's a really very cool article. All right. So with that, and for each one of these, I haven't done it yet. I'm a little bit behind. I apologize. I'm going to post the information. So for quinacridones, for pyrroles, for perylenes, I'm going to post the information so you can see the series. Um, whether it's transparent, whether it's opaque or semi-transparent, um, some of the information behind it, whether it's natural, wh where it comes from, I will post this. And I'll also post the, the C-Lab numbers. You can see which ones are the brightest and which ones are, you know, how they fall. I will post this information. All right, so with the time left, I think if we go really quick, we can see some colors. I know most of you have already seen all the colors, and, and I you know, really, really, your questions are really good, really good. And I think they're um, at such a level that I think other people would also enjoy hearing them. That's why I take the time to go over them. Um, I love seeing the colors, but I think knowledge is, 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 is more than just seeing colors. So we can probably go through at least at least all of these. So this is transparent brown oxides. Transparent brown oxide. Oh, you're welcome, Angela. Yeah, some of the pronunciations of these of these are just tongue twisters. I have hard, I have somewhat of the hardest time with one of the easiest ones, which is the the maroon. That is just a tongue twister for me. I don't know why that is, but it just is. I find the diketo pyrrol da 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 much easier to say than I do maroon, which I have to stop and think about. That's Terra Escalano. So 
So it's kind of interesting when you're painting these out, if you want to do this yourself, I find it interesting, is to, and this is available online anytime you want to do it, you can look at the colors and you can look at where they fit for their um, brightness and or where they fit for their, their coolness or warmness and actually kind of, once you're able to do that, you can read the C-Lab colors and actually and kind of see the color in your head. It's really quite interesting. This is uh, glossy on the light. I promised myself yesterday I was going to bring a, a, uh, a porcelain plate versus doing this on the paper. I can do that. So that's raw sienna light. My coffee is way blacker. <laughs> this is German greenish raw umber. So some of you asked about the Seattle store, and the Seattle store is still closed. Um, our numbers in Seattle kind of are kind of a, a little bit like a yo-yo. They go up and they go down. Um, I'm thinking maybe I don't know. It's just it's it's very hard to tell. This is Verona Gold Ochre. Gold ochre. I think the burnts, no matter what, um, burnt tiger's eye, burnt ochre, um, they're always intense. Oh, there you go, Maroon 5. You know, if I do that, Alexander, I can do that really quickly too. Maroon 5, Maroon, yeah, that works. I never thought about that. That's weird that when I do the word by itself, I have such issue, but when it's with something else it's so easy maroon five wow yeah and they're also a pretty good group so this is brown so this was burnt yellow ochre burnt yellow ochre burnt yellow ochre this is brown iron oxide. the transparent transparent red oxide yeah to burnt tiger's eye and tiger is, is neat oh I don't know maybe Raffaele um, gosh that's just you know we can play with that for a second a little bit of time So that is brown iron oxide and transparent red oxide. This is quite chocolate. This is Monte Amiata, so Monte Amiata from Monte Amiata, Italy. Batiza, Raffaele, and Giovanni. Too. You see that? So much um, So oxides. Again, this is in general. 
oxides for the most part are synthetic in general. You know, if you have rust outside an old car, or piece of iron, that's oxide. But these are um, these are synthetic, being made, being made in the laboratory. Um, ochres, um, ochres are very similar to oxides. They're, however, they're natural, and they have more clay. Okay, siennas, siennas are um, natural. They contain manganese and iron oxide. Byron. Um, the manganese is what gives it the, the brown color in the siennas. And umbers are like siennas in that they have manganese and iron oxide. However, they have way more magnesium, making them browner. Okay. Oh, that'd be really cool. I did a sketch of Dapple Palomino Horse with it as a only paint. Awesome. Okay, so didn't get quite through all of the colors I thought we were gonna get through, but we will we will next week. Um, they are pretty awesome though. I I really like the siennas and the ochres. They're not like the synthetics, so they're not the powerhouses of the pyrroles, the perilines, the quinacridones, um, but they're beautiful in their own right. Um, and so with that. I'm going to stop for today. I want to thank you all for joining me. I appreciate it. Love your questions. Um, let me know if I'm taking too long on questions versus paint outs. I, I kind of want to do a combination of both your, your questions are important to you, and if they're important to you, they're important to me. And, and I think they're really interesting. I, I really love them. Um, so we will continue uh, next week with the Ochres and Siennas. And uh, this, it's a really quite large family, and we'll get all through them. So thank you. Thank you all. I wish you health and safety, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for spending your time with me. Bye-bye.